Well, good afternoon and welcome back to the Johnson Space Center for today's status briefing on the STS-107 mission aboard Columbia. With us today to discuss the progress of the flight are Bob Castle, the STS-107 mission operations representative, Dr. John Charles, the STS-107 mission scientist, and Dr. Scott Smith, the principal investigator for the calcium metabolism experiment. And we'll start off with Bob. Okay. Well, good afternoon. Uh, my part of this will be very brief because uh, the Space Shuttle Orbiter continues to behave essentially flawlessly. Um, there's virtually no anomalies to talk about. Our cryo margins continue to look good and everything is, is going very well. The crew is performing very well. They're sounding good. They're, uh, they're on the timeline and things are getting accomplished uh, very nicely. So um, I really don't have much else to say. So, Dr. Charles. Thank you. Uh, things are going well for us. I'm not going to be quite as brief. Uh, the human life sciences payloads were activated today and the first data takes were taken. We have Dr. Scott Smith with us here to tell us more about that in a minute or so. But today's activities included the, the obligatory blood draws, blood on orbit processing, uh, ingestion and infusion of the various uh, tracers uh, for the metabolic studies, urine and uh, saliva collections, and uh, logging of food, exercise, and, and so forth for, uh, for analysis post-flight. The microbial physiology experiment uh, is uh, currently underway with the first card tray in place. Seven card trays remain for the uh, rest of the mission. Uh, in the uh, fundamental biology area, the uh, rodent health checks uh, have had two health checks so far. Everything is fine with the rodents. An experiment that we call BRIC, the biological research in canisters, uh, and as a study of uh, some of the uh, responses of, of uh, MOS samples in weightlessness, trying to duplicate previously uh, unexpected findings observed on a previous mission. And those, uh, those MOS specimens are now in complete darkness. The last LEDs, the light emitting diodes that gave them some sense of orientation and weightlessness have been turned off and now they're, they're free to grow in the spiral patterns that were observed and surprised the investigators after STS-87. And in terms of the physical sciences, the uh, mechanics of granular materials, the uh, study completed its second run just uh, shortly, uh, uh, shortly, a short time ago. We were watching the video of that. There were some interesting results from that. Uh, they'll continue. They have uh, seven more runs planned for the mission. The zeolite crystal growth experiment is continuing. Uh, it was initiated yesterday about this same time. And uh, uh, the facility is operating nominally. Uh, nominal operations continue and other experiments in the microgravity research area, the, uh, the accelerometers that we use to monitor the microgravity environment, we call it the SAMS uh, Space Acceleration Monitoring System, is functioning, but uh, there are some occasional dropouts of communication that can be worked around, just requires some brief rebooting. And the, uh, the uh, report that we got yesterday from uh, Scott, from the uh, Tom Goodwin about the bioreactor system. Bioreactor is continuing to function and the, uh, the cell culture and all of its me metabolic uh, uh, readouts are, are looking excellent. Uh, that team is now working on a, a slight temperature control problem, but uh, there are ways around that, so they anticipate uh, continued success with that investigation. And uh, later this afternoon, we'll be starting the combustion module experiments, the first of three uh, sets of studies on uh, how uh, combustion processes uh, in space flight and weightlessness especially differ from those on the ground and so forth as we've talked about before. So they'll be, that'll be the subject of uh, future uh, discussion at, at, uh, at this time. That's a brief overview of the science, uh, code U science, the uh, NASA science for this mission so far. I'd like to turn it over now to Dr. Scott Smith to talk in more detail about the calcium metabolism studies that are underway in space. Good afternoon. Uh, as Dr. Charles said, our experiment is, is looking at what we call calcium kinetics, which is the movement of calcium through the body. And the way we do that is we, we use uh, what we call tracers. That is, we give a, a special form of calcium to the astronauts, and they, they take one of these orally, one of them is, in, is infused intravenously, and we then collect biological samples over time and, and trace the movement of calcium through the body. Uh, it's, it's one of the great things we can do uh, to easily understand bones during, during space flight. Uh, the, the bone changes, as we all know, are very important during space flight. That is, the loss of bone is a, a significant health concern for astronauts. When we look at the, the shuttle crews, however, though, it, it, the amount of bone that's lost on a short duration flight on a few weeks really is not that significant. It's actually, hard, it's, it's actually very hard to measure the change in actual bone. So what we look at is the change in calcium, and we look at the change in markers of, of biochemistry, things that we can measure in the blood and in the urine that tell us, it, that tell us what the bones are doing. Uh, and, and that's what our experiment is designed to do. Today is, uh, is an incredible day for us. It's, uh, it's our biggest flight day, flight day three. Uh, the, the crews both took uh, an oral calcium tracer, uh, and then an hour later they infused a, a calcium tracer. 
uh, and as I said, they'll, they'll follow those in the biological samples they'll collect over the next several days. Um, a few things to point out. Uh, Today's been a, an incredible day. We've, we've gotten everything we could have asked for, uh, and the crew did an outstanding job. The, the training that they went through uh, obviously paid off. They did a phenomenal job. Um, if you listen to the pre-flight interviews of the astronauts, many of them talked about how challenging the timeline was going to be and how complex the mission was, and oftentimes in their minds, and if you talk to them, they, they would tell you that, that Flight Day 3 uh, is one of the more challenging because of the choreography that was involved. Uh, and if you look at what went on this morning, uh, it was just incredible. We had everybody kicking in uh, in one way or other to help with the experiment. We had uh, Dave infusing tracers into Mike, Mike infusing tracers into Dave, and, and Laurel and Alon doing the same. We had Willie drawing blood samples. We had uh, uh, Casey helping out with, with spinning blood samples in the centrifuge. Uh, and Rick's even been trained to, to draw blood and to help out there. So it really was a, a team effort that helped to, uh, to kick us off and to, to get us rolling. Uh, and at this point, it's only flight day three, but we really are over the hump uh, in terms of our experiment. This is the hard part. The rest of it is just uh, watching the traces as they, as they come out and, uh, and looking forward to getting the samples back when the shuttle lands. One thing uh, I, I do want to hit is that um, this has been an incredible experience. As you know, this, this mission has been a long time in coming, and we've been working uh, quite a way in this. Uh, I just want to put a plug in. We did a, a, a fair amount of educational outreach with regard to this experiment uh, to help target Elementary, elementary age kids to help them not only appreciate the, the science that NASA does and understanding of why NASA does, does science, uh, but also to, to help them get an appreciation for what it takes to do an experiment on the space shuttle and to realize that uh, the science doesn't start the day that the SRBs ignite, that there's a lot of work that goes into the pre-flight work, that we study the astronauts before the mission, during the mission, and after the mission, uh, and to understand how complex and, and exciting science at NASA can be. Uh, and we also use this as a way to, to almost trick the kids, if you will, uh, in that we get them excited in the experiment and, and talking about science at NASA. But when we look at it from a health perspective, kids are the ones that we need to target in terms of getting more chem in their diets. Uh, and, and by talking to them about our experiment and explaining what we do and why we do it, uh, we can also help impart some, some basic health information. So we really have tried to, to target this experiment in, in many ways, not only for scientific gain, uh, but also for educational outreach and, and hitting on, on many of NASA's major goals. With that, I'll, I'll turn it back to you folks. Great. Thanks, Scott. We'll take, uh, John, did you have something to add? Okay, we'll take questions here in Houston first before going down to the other centers, uh, starting off with Mark Carell. Oh, thank you. I'm Mark Carell from Houston Chronicle. I had a couple of questions. One, I wanted to ask Dr. Smith if you could talk a little bit about what the results would be useful in as far as developing countermeasures, or is that really a goal here? Are you looking just more at the process, um, or is there some intent really to see if there's some sort of intervention to uh, control the calcium loss? Well, ultimately, obviously, our goal at NASA is to, is to help mitigate or, or or reduce, if not eliminate, the bone loss during space flight. Um, what we're doing on this flight will help us to understand the early changes during space flight, what happens in the first days to weeks uh, of weightlessness, uh, and how the body adapts to that. We have done some preliminary studies on Mir. We're looking forward, hopefully, to be able to do these studies on, on Space Station to look at the time course of changes in calcium metabolism over time. Uh, and it, not only can we understand the changes, but also looking at counteracting them. We're involved in several studies on the ground, uh, looking at things like bed rest and other models to, to come up with ways to counteract the bone loss. But with regard to STS-107 in and of itself, we're not testing a countermeasure. If I might just follow on that, how does this particular experiment build on what you've done before in this regard? Or is this sim simply widening the sample? Or is this, this particular experiment a little more sophisticated? It's, it's both. It, it, uh, it's widening the sample, but it's also giving us, as I said, the early adaptation. The preliminary studies we did on Mir were primarily done toward the end of the flight, at about 100 days of flight. And this will let us look at the first two weeks of flight and compare those two and see whether or not the, the adaptation is, is growing, whether or not it occurs very rapidly and then plateaus off, or if there is a, a progressive increase over time. Okay, thank you very much. And I had another question, a broader question yesterday. Um, there was some um, working or concern about the uh, the uh, the uh, the data and the recording and the data and sending it down and there was some um, work around going on where the astronauts were recording data and then sending it down and you were trying to troubleshoot this on some of the experiments. I just wondered if if you had either worked a 
an arrangement out to continue that or or now you're back in the in the in the mode that you wanted to be in the beginning at the beginning of the mission well, the, as far as I know the, the troubleshooting is continuing the the, the issues uh, that were discussed yesterday are, are still being studied and uh, but we're collecting data if the data is not coming to the ground as we originally hoped it is being recorded on board so there there's no data loss and it's just a matter of convenience now. I, I'm confident that, that they're going to figure out the, the data problems though in the near future. Okay, I think we have questions down at the Kennedy Space Center. Hi guys, it's Bill Hart with CBS. I had a couple of questions about calcium loss and I apologize because I think some of the outreach probably never got to me or I didn't read it, but I had a, a, a very dumb question I wanted to ask and that is the loss of calcium, does it plateau at some point or as far as we know it, it drops straight off and keeps dropping as long as you're there if you don't do anything? In other words, I'm, trying, I'm wondering what that graph looks like as far as we know. I wonder what that graph looks like too because we don't have that answer yet and that's one of the things that we hope to gain from this flight. Uh, we know from, from looking at ground data, if we look at at models that are similar. If we look, for instance, at, at individuals that are paralyzed uh, who lose bone that looks, the bone loss in, in somebody who's been recently paralyzed looks an awful lot like what we see during space flight. Uh, if you look at the, the literature from those subjects, um, they, their bone loss plateaus at about six months. Uh, I would guess that the, the bone loss during space flight will take a little bit longer uh, because most of what we see during space flight is a little greater than what we see on the ground. Uh, but again, we don't have that data yet, and that's one of the things we're, we're really hoping to get. Uh, we're, getting, we're getting another piece uh, of the puzzle out of the shuttle flight, and then hopefully we'll be able to do this uh, again on the station to be able to look at, at different durations and see how well, uh, how these changes do occur. Suspicions uh, whether or not there's a similar mechanism involved. No, I'm trying to get the sense of whether or not it's the, the active movement of the body or the lack or presence of gravity itself that's playing a role here. Well, I think, I maintain that the, the body is doing, uh, the body's adaptation to weightlessness, the body's doing exactly what we pay it to do. That is, it, it realizes that you're in a weightless environment, it, it does not need the bones, that it doesn't need the, the same amount of bone to carry you around as it did when you were on the ground. And it's just saying, okay, bone is, is very metabolically costly, that is the body, you know, if the body knows it doesn't need it, there's no need to maintain it, so it says let's get rid of this uh, and not carry it around. Uh, it clearly, at some point, the bone loss will level off. There's nobody, I don't think there's anybody that thinks that uh, if you were to stay in spaceflight forever, that at some point you'd run out of bone. Uh, that, that's not going to happen. At some point, you'd, you would reach a steady state. You would reach uh, space normal, if you will, uh, for bone mass. And that would be fine if you were going to stay in, in microgravity forever. Uh, the problem is most of the folks that we send want to come back. Uh, and at that point, you do need a greater bone mass. Thanks. And, and one more along those lines. I was just, you were mentioning the ISS. It strikes me as pretty uh, occasionally invasive research to do, but I mean, long term wise, it looks pretty straightforward. And I was wondering how we had, uh, do you have anything like this on IS yet? And if not, why not? Well, that's, uh, that's another great question. Uh, again, we did do some preliminary studies on MIR uh, and, and hope to get back on ISS. We have proposed to do these studies. Uh, and at this point, uh, it is, uh, we, are, we are very, what they call resource intensive. Uh, that is, we take a lot of crew time, as you can see from the schedule today. Uh, we take a lot of freezer volume. Uh, we take a lot of up mass. We take a lot of down mass. And all those things uh, tend to hinder uh, the excitement to fly uh, payloads on ISS at this point. But we are very excited to get to the point where, uh, where we'll be able to do this on ISS. Thanks a lot. And, and two last quick ones for John. I was just curious, is, are there any plans at, at any point to see uh, the rodents on Downlink TV, or is that not part of the experiment protocol? It's not part of the protocol for this flight. And a last question for me, sir, um, and I know that this isn't your ball of wax either, so to speak, but on the, on the ant farm, I mean, the video, I realize it's trivial compared to what the big stuff you guys are doing, but still need to look at it. I was just wondering if you'd heard anybody say whether or not the, the tunneling that those little guys are doing looks normal or if it looks at all weird or affected by weightlessness. We, uh, we, I haven't heard anything about that, but, but as far as I'm not an ant expert, but they look normal to me. We can check into that, though, and get an answer for you. Okay, that was the last question uh, at the Kennedy Space Center. Any follow-ups here? Seeing none, we'll close uh, with a programming note. All of the video of the last 24 hours of activities on board Columbia will be contained in our Flight Day Highlights package.
to be seen for the first time tonight on NASA TV at 9 p.m. Central Time, 10 p.m. Eastern Time, repeated every hour on the hour throughout the sleep period for the red team. With the holiday weekend upon us, there'll be no mission status briefing either tomorrow or Monday. Our next mission status briefing is on tap for Tuesday at 12 noon Central Time, 1 p.m. Eastern Time. That's on Tuesday. For the current mission television schedule on STS-107, which is Rev B, as in Bravo, all the latest news on the Space Shuttle and International Space Station programs, please visit our human spaceflight website at spaceflight.nasa.gov. With that, we'll return to mission control and coverage of the STS-107 scientific research flight. Thanks very much.